Hello, my name is Jillian Davison. I'm a faculty member at the Orlando Health Emergency Medicine Program, where I serve as the Emergency Ultrasound Co-Director. And today, I'm going to present I'd Tapsy That, Why Using Bedside Ultrasound to Evaluate Right Heart Strain in PE Matters. So why do we care about ultrasounding the heart of a PE patient? We already know that a PE is the easiest dispo there is, right? Start anticoagulation and admit. And if they crash on you, give TPA. But what are we potentially missing? We have very few scoring systems for risk stratifying PE patients. The simplified PESI score aims to identify very low risk patients with the potential for discharge home, but doesn't take right heart strain into account at all, which could result in drastic misses. The mortality in PE is devastating. Up to half of all massive PE patients die, and these are just the ones that make it to our EDs. While most small PE patients fare well, we need to pay closer attention to this group, the submassives. Submassive PEs have a mortality upwards of 15%, and they are hiding behind their lack of hemodynamic instability. Submassives may have some clinical clues, but many of these are nonspecific and may take hours to result. Submassive PEs are hemodynamically stable. They may have tachycardia and tachypnea. Once we have the luxury of lab results, we might see a nonspecific elevated trope or BNP. But the heart of a submassive PE is the hidden right heart strain. Right heart strain can be a nebulous term and can reveal itself as EKG changes and elevated biomarkers, but these are not exactly specific findings. What we need in these cases is to directly visualize right heart strain using ultrasound. You can visualize right heart strain in several different cardiac views, but the holy grail is naturally the most difficult to obtain, the apical four. This beauty lets you visualize the functionality of all four chambers simultaneously, as well as the overall motion of the heart on its axis. So that brings us to right ventricular systolic dysfunction. This is why massive and submassive PEs are so deadly because they create an acute right-sided heart failure that if left untreated will progress to hemodynamic collapse. So how can we quantify this? That's where TAPC comes into play. TAPC stands for Tricuspid Annular Plane Systolic Excursion and is measured using M mode where the tricuspid leaflet connects to the right ventricular free wall. Think of this as a measure of how much the heart moves up and down. A healthy heart muscle will move up and down a lot, giving a higher number. A strained heart moves less, resulting in a lower TAPC, which has been independently linked to a higher mortality in PE. Multiple studies have examined TAPSI measurements in relation to PE mortality. You can see that there is no definitive cutoff for abnormal, but most studies agree that somewhere around 17 millimeters or less is an abnormally low TAPSI. Now, let's play a game where you apply your bedside ultrasound skills and decide on the best treatment for your PE patients. You can only use each treatment once. Each patient is complaining of chest pain and shortness of breath and has normal oxygen saturations. This patient is mildly tachycardic and hemodynamically stable. Labs and EKG are pending. You measure a TAPSI of 14 millimeters. Your treatment options include heparin, intervention, or TPA. This patient is mildly tachycardic and hemodynamically stable. Labs and EKG are pending. You measure a TAPSI of 20 millimeters. Your treatment options include heparin, intervention, or TPA. This patient is mildly tachycardic and hemodynamically unstable. Labs and EKG are pending. You only have one treatment option remaining. Feel free to pause this game show now since pandemic technology has made this possible. Patient number one has evidence of RV strain on this bedside echo and an abnormally low TAPSI of 14. They are at high risk for deterioration despite their normal blood pressure and would benefit from early interventions such as catheter-directed thrombolysis. Patient number two has no RV strain and a normal TAPSI. They should do just fine with heparin and observation. Patient number three has massive RV strain and a large right atrial clot. Their hemodynamic instability along with this ominous bedside echo indicates that TPA may be their only viable treatment. In summary, always use bedside echo in PE to evaluate for right ventricular systolic dysfunction. A TAPSI measurement of approximately 17 millimeters or less is independently linked to increased mortality even in hemodynamically stable patients. Use this information in combination with the patient's hemodynamics and clinical judgment to determine if intervention, such as catheter-directed thrombolysis, is best. 
In short, tap see that and save lives. Here are my references and thank you so much for listening. Good luck to everyone out there during the pandemic. And as Mel Herbert would say, thank you for all that you do because what you do matters. <laughs>